I'll just start with a very small uh, imagination. Just imagine that tomorrow you get up in the morning and suddenly you realize that your internet connection is off for next one week. What kind of a nightmare that would be? I think in today's generation it is really impossible to even imagine such a thing. We can live without food, maybe water also, but like imagining our lives without internet would be a big, big, big a dead trend, right? So coming from the era, uh, being a 90s kid, things were way different back then. So when I was in the ninth standard, somehow my sister convinced my dad to buy a first personal computer. And uh, we had a one year internet connection also along with that. In that era, internet used to work on a different uh, scale altogether. So you had to first dial up your modem through a landline phone. And then it used to basically literally block your phone. And then the internet used to work. So the next one month, me and my sister had the best time of our lives. We just explored it to the fullest. And when, after a month, phone's bill came, it was around 50,000 Indian rupees. My dad had to literally break his fixed deposit to pay it off. And we had some real tough time with him. The internet at that time was very different. So they were like the static pages. We call it as Web 1.0. So you've had to put certain content on that. You needed certain expertise. Skills like HTML, all these things were required. Majority of the people thought that this is going to be just a fad. Even the top journals, newspapers of the world had written it off completely. And it almost died in 2001 when the dot-com crash happened. But as we say, it just rose from its ashes like a phoenix and has come a long way in all these years. So, I'll just fast forward my life to the time when I was at college. During my days at IIT Delhi, the internet evolved into a completely different thing altogether due to a new technology called smartphones. The net became more interactive. Aggregators like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, or OTTs like Netflix, all these things kind of flooded our lives with a lot of different stuff. So people were able to upload the content also and at the same time able to consume the content. But the problem with this kind of internet was that at that time the aggregator became way too powerful. I clearly remember way back in 2007 I coded one of the first Facebook applications in India called India Dekha and at that time hardly 50,000 users used to be there in India on Facebook. But in matter of days things started changing and now today we know that we are one of the biggest market markets for Facebook globally. So what exactly was the paradigm shift with this? The problem was, with so much power resting in the hands of the aggregators, the people who were the actual content makers, they kind of got marginalized. They were not getting their right due. They just were not motivated enough, incentivized enough to give their best shot in coming up with the best content possible. And on top of it, with so much power, as we say, comes a lot of responsibility also. But due to certain eccentricity of these platforms, things change for the negative side. A lot of policies changes were there. People were not even able to track how things are moving in a certain direction. You're building a digital asset and you don't even know whether you own it the next day or not. There might be a policy change and it might get blocked forever. So there was a lot of such challenges with the people. So what exactly that led to? The major problem that it led to was a lot of substandard content started coming on the platform. Anybody with a mobile phone became a content creator. And during the COVID, TikTok took it to a completely different level altogether. So a lot of misconception was there. A lot of people were giving their opinions about things which they had no clue about. Then, almost in 2013, from 10 years from now, a miracle, I would say, a near miracle happened where some of the best minds of the world thought that the world should work in a different way. We have to understand what is the importance of actually a digital asset is. Just imagine you have 1 million followers on a social media platform. In today's world, that social media platform with 1 million followers has so much power that it can be more valuable than all your physical assets put together. I'll just give a very small example. Just imagine that among those 1 million followers, 5% of the people, that is like 50,000 people, are your ardent followers. People who would do anything to be a part of whatever you offer. And you run a masterclass where you're offering it for 
ten dollars. And just one single shot, you get half a million dollars for just one single masterclass. And this is what majority of the influencers have been doing. So due to that, people invest good seven, eight years building that digital asset. But the problem is, in today's world, all that digital asset is getting built in thin air. Why? Because the platform on which you are building, you don't have any ownership on that. So if tomorrow that platform wants to take you down, they can take you down in a blink of an eye. So this is where the, some of the best minds in the world thought differently. They thought that having power resting in few hands is very dangerous for the world. So why don't we just decentralize it? Why don't we give more power back to the community where certain rule sets are getting decided pre-hand and they are immutable. Once written, they cannot be changed. Anybody signing up for that particular platform would know that what exactly he or she is up to and then the entire rule set work, work according to that. And if there is any change, there has to be certain common consensus. So this was the third version, the third layer of internet called Web3. So you could own the content, you could create the content, you could consume the content. So with this, the decentralized platforms took it to a completely different ballgame altogether. But the problem today is the end users, majority of the end users don't shift to new platforms just because they are inclined with certain type of ideology. I think majority of us would not even be able to relate to it also. We don't even know whether these things are even important. I've been to a lot of seminars and I've always asked what is the biggest plus with Web3 and they say, sir, it brings in a lot of privacy. Ask your parents, who might be even a much bigger content consumers in today's world as compared to you because you have so many other things to look up to and they might not be even bothered by that. So privacy, we might think is very important, but is not that important. But an end user, the biggest adaption happens when the delta is big. When the previous application that they were using and the new application now they're going to use is offering a much better user experience. We almost had this moment last year with chat GPT. If almost a year back, if I would have had this talk and uttered this word chat GPT, I think majority of the class would not have been able to relate to it. But that's not the case anymore. By December last year, I think majority of the people were familiar with it. And the transformation happened overnight because the user experience was so big. And in Web3 also, I think this is going to happen because the reason is, since the best minds of the world are building this space, it is just a matter of few years when they'll be able to create that delta where from an end user's perspective, the whole experience will be so overwhelming, so ahead of its time that they will just migrate to the new platform in a matter of a few days. Uh, Metaverse, for that example, is once a step in this direction already. So what is there for the Indian ecosystem in this? First of all, we really need to understand the ethos of Web2. So what exactly Web2 is based on? If you understand what exactly Web2 is, it's all about eccentricity. It's all about capitalism. So this is what the Western world also believes in. If you are in the US, I think the response time to your emergency services is dependent on the tax money that you pay. The society structure is such. And it's almost the same that gets reflected in the brilliant applications coming out of that ecosystem. But with Web3, the core ethos are aligned with community play. It's about giving power back to the community. If we talk about the Indian ecosystem, that is where I think we people can create the real differentiator. Community play is something that comes naturally to us, something we are born and bred in. By the time we step out of into this world, this is something that we experience on a daily basis. Even social concepts like kitty party, that the majority of the middle class and upper middle class families are part of, is a classical example of community at play in managing the finance. The mothers plan their major buys depending on the day they are keeping the kitty party pot because they get all the money on that day and it's a beautiful example of how community can actually decentralize the finance and can 
reap the maximum benefit out of that. There are many such solutions in the Indian ecosystem, which I personally believe can be easily replicated into world-class applications. With Web2, we kind of missed that bus. We couldn't become the Microsoft and the Facebooks of the world. But I think with Web3, with times on our hand, this is our one big chance. With core ethos aligned with our core ethos, I think we know what it takes to replicate the offline experiences of community play into world-class tech. Something that exactly happened in the US during Web2. Google was a PhD project. Facebook was a college project. So if they could turn their college projects and PhD projects into world-beating tech, I think we as a country also can do it with our community play. So what is the roadmap ahead for the Indian ecosystem? So how do you think we can take the next steps? We have to understand, as a, as a country, we have a history of bypassing certain generations of tech revolutions and leaping forward to the latest technology. Happened with finance that from hard money to digital money happened seamlessly. We never went to the plastic money, we simply migrated to UPI. It almost happened with our 2G spectrum also. Post 2G spectrum, India just never entered the 3D spectrum. It just straight away leaped to the 4G spectrum. And now we even see 5G and 6G is also almost on the horizon. So this is the kind of history that we have, that we have the ability, we have the history where we've been able to leap forward and able to jump out of the queue and be the leaders in that particular tech. Even though we haven't embraced Web2 to its fullest, but we have the potential where we can straight away be the part of this Web3 ecosystem and can lead it from the front. Because again, I mentioned, this is more aligned to what we people believe. So what kind of applications are actually useful for the Indian ecosystem? First of all, we have to understand one thing, that majority of the Indian population still faces the problem with financial inclusion. If you talk about the rural sector, the suburban sector, majority of the people are not even part of the banking system. Even if they're using UPIs, they cannot have the access to loans, they cannot have the access to investment opportunities. There are many such big misses. So with the decentralized finance based applications, this is something which can be plucked. Something where we see huge potential in the Indian ecosystem. Even with the supply chain management, with a lot of focus now back onto the organic products, if we put our entire supply chain management on blockchain, with a lot of transparency involved at every step, it is possible for us from the time it gets delivered by the farmers to the time it reaches our kitchens. We can track every single step involved and see, can see a lot of transparency happening in that particular phase. Even one major problem, which is related to the duplicate product market, can be eliminated. Just imagine you go to a party, owning a Louis Vuitton bag, which you had bought for like 5 lakh Indian rupees, and your next neighbor gets the first copy of it for 5,000, and you both end up in the same party, flaunting the same bag. Majority of the crowd would not be able to even differentiate that. But if you happen to have a digital copy of that as maybe an NFT on your digital wallet when the game changes. Because then you have the original certificate from the company that you own the original product. That 100x that you're spending on that valuable luxury product somehow gets justified. So this is how even the duplicate product market can be eliminated. One other major concern is the college degrees. Even in US, there's a huge problem that many of the polished degrees at the PhD level are also fake. So similarly, India has also had similar problems over the years. So minting all that on blockchain, which is immutable, once minted in your name cannot be changed, can eliminate all those things. And also applying to other colleges for post-graduation or maybe other higher courses would also become a lot seamless. The thing is, opportunities are endless. We can tap into it, we can make it big, but we have to understand that first of all, we have to embrace, we have to understand this thing that we are living in the vision created by the entrepreneurs. So if the best minds of the world are moving in a certain space, we have to look for those opportunities, catch hold of them, and take our organization, our society, our country to the next big leap. I've already done that. I was a part of the Web2 ecosystem. 
for almost last 14 years. But when this Web3 opportunity came in, I was the first one to dive in, dive out of the Web2 and dive into the Web3. Little unknown are definitely awaiting me, but I'm up for the challenge because I personally believe this is our moment, our big chance to be the next Facebooks, Instagrams, and Microsofts of the world. Thank you. Thank you.